each week, we get to the heart of the issues dominating the headline. Tonight, to governors to choose. But U-turn or not, the Prime Minister, just four weeks in, must know that many in her own ranks are taking bets on when, not if, she will fall. She said she'd act, but not even her harsh critics anticipated the events of the last week. And now, as people fret over their bills and their mortgages, there are questions about the credibility of our government. As ever, our viewers panel from across the country and indeed across the world will share their stories and they'll have their say. And joining us in the studio this week are the businesswoman and Dragon's Den judge Deborah Meaden, the columnist from The Times, James Marriott, Gina Miller, the author and businesswoman who successfully challenged the government's prorogation of parliament. And John Longworth, the entrepreneur, chairman of the Independent Business Network, who joins us from Birmingham. So let's take a look at our main question. Tonight, we're asking, is Britain still great? Why not? Why can't we do it? We may be a small island, but I tell you what, we're a great country. I know because we're Great Britain that we will rise to the challenge. Britain will always stand up for freedom and democracy. I intend to deliver what we promised those voters right across our great country. All of the talk here is of a highly significant U-turn by the government. Are you going to say sorry, Chancellor? I do stand by the package we announced. They are neither the right economic nor the right political response to the situation that we face. It feels like you can't dream anymore. They can either cut their consumption or they can get higher salary or higher wages. It has been tough, but with the British people, absolutely anything is possible. Right, as always, let's get into it and go straight to our audience panel. And I would like to hear from Patrice Wellesley-Cole. Good evening, Patrice. Good evening, Trevor. Thank you. Good to see you again. What's, uh, what's your thoughts yes. on this greatness question? Well, Trevor, uh, Britain is Great Britain because we have a permanent seat on the Security Council. We have a rich history, the welfare state and culture. Then there's a sense of fair play and a lack of corruption, making for transparency and accountability in all our public bodies. Where else would you want to live compared to Great Britain? Well, that is pretty straightforward. I'm not sure everybody agrees with that. Let's go to... Natalie Bon Cristiano. Um, Natalie, uh, do you recognize Patrice's description of our country? Yes, I do. However, I'm a single mom and I work for a corporate job in aluminium industry, and uh, we use a lot of energy uh, to melt the scrap, for example. And the anxiety levels at the moment, it's really high up because we don't know what it's going to happen here in UK. We don't know what's going to happen in Europe and our customers. So this is being in my mind and the anxiety level, not just the, the, the crisis in UK, but this is, am I going to have a job or not? And um, what I see is the pillars that sustain Great Britain is crumbling because, for example, if you consider, in addition to, to what Patricia said, strong currency, NHS, credibility with the market, those pillars are crumbling at the moment. OK. Well, there are two quite uh, diametrically opposed views of uh, our country and by implication its feature. Um, Deborah Meaden, where are you lining up? Uh, well, I lined up with Patrice. Is there anybody else, anywhere else in the world I'd like to live? No, this is my country. I love it. Um, but I also realise that we're in a very uh, strange state at the moment. We're a little bit hung up on this word great. I mean, Great Britain actually refers to the fact we're the biggest island in the British Isles. And we kind of get, gets, gets into our DNA and we mm. kind of think we're, the, you know, it means that we're this big, strong... Um, but for me, you've got to define what we want to be. What would we consider a great country? And we've got all of those elements, 
but they're being lost at the moment. They're whirring around in the ether, and I think we're lacking cohesion. So anybody looking at us might think, ooh, they're having a bit of a wobbly. So, so you're basically saying we're sort of got... We've got all the ingredients, but it isn't really cooked in the right way. Where are you on this, Gina? I have to agree that I think all the ingredients are there. When you look at where else would you want to live, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I do think we have great um, art, culture, great people. If you look at the number of Nobel Prize winners we have, they're like some of the best in the world, universities, art. But there is leadership problems that we are in, we're seeing at the moment. I think we're, having a la we ha we're suffering from a lack of direction, a lack of leadership, a lack of courage and compassion. And there is a nervousness and almost a depression that I find I'm, I'm going around the country with, our, with the True and Fair Party that is, is worrying because if we don't have that feeling that we have good leaders, that we can trust them and that we can actually build on what makes us great, then we have a country which is feeling if, almost going through a nervous breakdown. And I think that's where we are at the moment. And the, that leads to fear and it leads to division and inequality. And those are the things we have to address. John Longworth, um, we're, we're getting a sort of uh, a consensus here, which is this is a country that's got it all to play for, but actually we're making a bit of a mess of it, aren't we? Well, certainly we've got every opportunity, and that opportunity has been squandered to some degree since we left the European Union in 2016. But it doesn't mean, of course, that we can't take advantage of it. I mean, Britain, contrary to popular opinion, and a lot of people prepared to talk the country down, is actually doing rather well by comparison with the rest of the world who are actually all suffering from the post-pandemic uh, slowdown. We, are, we have the second lowest debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7 countries. Uh, we have the highest level of exports to the EU that we've ever had. The economy is still growing, uh, and yet uh, other parts of the world are facing recession. But we could do so much better. And actually, okay. everything that we have, all the things that have been mentioned, depend on the economy. So having a growing economy is crucial. We're going to come back to all of that. And also, of course, we're going to talk about breakfast. But, this, James, this is a remarkably cheerful uh, prospect. Do you share it? Well, I think the really interesting point there was about history. And I think one of the really unique things about Britain is that in our not-too-distant past, we had this extraordinary history, You basically unique in the world. The empire, the first industrialised country, one of the first um, modern democracies. And I think the danger is that we assume that all these extraordinary values, this extraordinary position in the world that we had, will just... We can coast along that forever. And those habits of mind, I think, are still quite recent to us still quite present and we might sometimes have to look at where we are now and perhaps not rely so much on, you know, these automatic ideas about British values and Britain's automatic position in the world that, you know, I think sustained us until, you know, for so long and until quite recently. OK. Well, actually, not surprisingly, uh, James, since you're so much younger than <laughs> both the rest of us, you're, you're focused on the future. I want to talk to someone else who I think would also be looking to the future. Connor Summerall um, uh, in Mansfield. Uh, Connor, I think... Get me, forgive me if I'm wrong about this, I think you're 16. So I think you're, yeah. you're probably thinking rather more about what, what happens next than what happened before. You've got a question for Yeah, no, panel. and I'm just... Yeah, with all the bad news that seems to be coming out daily for what's felt like months, I'm just wondering, what reasons are there to be hopeful for Britain over the next year? Have you got any of your own, uh, Connor? Um, I mean, the economy in theory should do better. OK, all right. Um, Gina, help Connor out here. What, what, what are the reasons to be cheerful for Britain? I think Connor actually has a lot to worry about and future generations have a lot to worry about because we are burdening them by not taking responsibility and not being fiscally responsible at the moment and loading debt on them in the future is a great worry. And the cost of rental, cost of accommodation, the lack of investment in skills and training, um, the lack of investment in childcare for when Connor wants to have a family, if he does in the future. Um, the, the way that we've got a, a curriculum that really is not fit for the future is still stuck in the past. Um, these are things we need to 
invest in. And that's how you get growth, by investing in these infrastructure, in opportunities, in upskilling. In, and these are the things that will help, Connor. But what I think I, is hopeful is I think the younger generation are much more realistic about the environment. I think that's something that we have to be, that they are incredibly hopeful for, is that they are, I think, the generation that is going to take this seriously. And that's a positive um, Deborah, for him. Deborah, the, um, the, the environment and the green cause has been uh, your central concern in recent times, hasn't it? Well, it has, but actually I'm going to pick up on that because I think that's a real reason to be hopeful, not just because I think they're embracing the issues that we have in front of us and are willing to tackle them, but in that there is opportunity. We shouldn't look at this and think, oh, my goodness, what do we do? We should look at it and think, actually, we need to change the way we're, li we're living, we need to change the way we're doing business, and the young are incredibly well-placed to do that because they don't have the legacy. You know, they're not working with the old. So I think there is actually a lot of hope because there's actually a lot of opportunity in this new green future. But, uh, you know, you can't get away from the fact we've got to help them. You know, we can't just say, there you are, guys, over to you. OK, thank you, Deborah. I'm going to come back to the viewers' panel because I want to see what the mood of our audience is on this question of whether we should feel optimistic about who we are right now or whether we should feel more pessimistic. Let's see. Those of you who, who feel tonight, at this moment, optimistic about Britain and whether we call it great or not, those who feel optimistic, hands up, what are we seeing? We're seeing probably slightly less than hmm, a half of you. OK, you can put your hands down. Those who feel are inclined to feel more pessimistic tonight. Let's have a look. I think right now we're sort of... We're kind of half and half. OK, let me come to Jackie Skip. Jackie, where do you stand on this, in this balance between the optimists and the pessimists? Um, I think at the moment I'm leaning towards the pessimist, um, but I just wanted to ask the panel, can we carry on like this? Um, or is a snap election needed? Um, let us have our say about it. Wow, OK. Now, that's maybe a way to <laughs> break the deadlock. James, snap election. Well, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I feel like we've been through so much uncertainty at the moment. And one of the things that I felt recently is that Britain, which has had quite a good tradition of stable government in the last, you know, six years, we've had three prime ministers, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, now Liz Truss, the prospect of yet another election, or even, you know, if the Conservative Party decides to get rid of Liz Truss, yet another great big dragging, endless feeling Conservative Party leadership election. I find it a bit hard to stomach, but you have to say, you know, the further we get away from that 2019 election uh, where Boris Johnson came in, you know, the sort of the further we feel, the further we feel away from any sort of sense of legitimacy that, you know, the government now has, especially with these very kind of radical new policies that have come in with the mini budget that um, that came out last week. OK. John, you're um, in Birmingham with the Conservative Party uh, conference, so you're no doubt getting the mood. Is there any appetite there for a snap election or indeed another leadership contest? Well, there are some rumours about uh, that sort of thing. I mean, I think if, if we were to have another leadership contest, there'd have to be a general election because it simply wouldn't be tenable. But the truth of the matter is that uh, Trustonomics, Liz Truss's uh, agenda for the UK economy, for the first time in a lot of people's living memory, we're actually trying to go for growth as a country, rather than having a constant round of austerity, uh, uh, which, which does nobody any good. So really, we should feel quite optimistic, because within a year's time, we should be looking at growth north of 2%. So you uh, Reasonable interest rates and, and inflation under control. So, John, you'd, you'd stick with it. No election, no snap election for you. Well, unless the leadership is replaced, I mean, if the leadership was replaced again, I think we have to have a snap election at that point because it would be against the vote of the, the membership of the Conservative Party. John, thank you. Let's go to a break. This is the great debate. Up next, has Britain's international reputation been damaged by the financial turmoil of the last week? This is the choice that humanity has to make in every age. 
The world is calling for peace. We will not rest until Ukraine prevails.